Hi, right, everyone. I, I think we'll get started. Uh, usually, we like to wait 15 minutes because there's lot, lots of people that show up late and they'll still keep coming. But um, we're, we're limited until 5.30 in this space, and that's a hard uh, stop. So, uh, and so we're going to have four talks, each around 20 minutes. And uh, um, we'll, um, um, we should, it should all work out pretty well. And then we'll, we're going to go downstairs to the second floor. So the elevator is right you know, outside this door here. You, you all used it. So just take that to the second floor. And there's a place there called Marshall Landing, which is kind of a combination coffee shop and bar. And that place is open later. And they have food, too. Uh, and, and it's big, and we can talk there. Um, I think they're closed for a private event. Oh, are they? When I oh, walked by up here, they were. Oh. So I don't know. Oh. Uh, this, so, yeah, if anyone has any other ideas for a bar run. <laughs> 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 um, uh, yeah, so that's unfortunate. Um, should have, should have uh, called them to make sure they're open. Um, OK, well, we'll, we'll figure that out. I'll make another announcement at the end. Um, so yeah, so um, uh, this right here is probably going to be, I'm, I'm hoping, will be uh, the ongoing space for this meetup. Uh, so it's going to be the second Thursday of every month, hopefully, uh, space permitting. Uh, but it'll probably be later. So some people weren't uh, so comfortable with a four o'clock meeting time. So we're going to we're going to probably do it like at five thirty or six, and um, uh, uh, moving forward, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, certainly, if any one of you uh, wants to talk about anything related to Ethereum. Um, uh, especially if it uh, is technical, like involves actual smart contracts, uh, more than just an ICO announcement. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're, uh, let me know. Uh, there's plenty of room for people to present. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, so we're going to have four talks uh, where we change it around a little bit because maybe the issues. So uh, uh, Tony is going to start with the first talk uh, about um, uh, a tipping system. Uh, built on top of Ethereum. I'll take it from there. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you, Conrad, for organizing these meetups. He always does a great job. Oh, yeah, and I definitely want to thank uh, Matter Health, the provider of the space, for uh, making this possible. Yeah. Thank you, Matter. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Tony Clausing. I'm a Chicago based uh, programmer. For uh, a couple of months, I've been learning about distributed applications on the Ethereum network, and I'll present uh, what I'm working on today. Um, I'm calling it Tweet Wallet. Uh, the idea is that you control your crypto with smart contracts and social media. I have a few uh, premises about why this is something interesting. Um, firstly, I think, and many crypto enthusiasts would agree, that key management by individuals is essential for decentralized peer-to-peer eCash, the idea that you can be your own bank, that you can have a Swiss bank account in your wallet. Um, it's pretty cool, and um, to really realize that vision, um, it's pretty difficult, because private key management is really painful. As you may know, if you control Ether or Bitcoin, what that really means is that you control a big, long number, and if you lose that big, long number, then you've effectively lost your funds, you've lost your money. So um, that happens a lot, and a lot of people have lost many billions of dollars because of that. Um, so another premise is that tech giants offer the best practicable security, ease of use, um, and identity management. They offer um, good services like two-factor authentication, machine-learned fraud detection, and human employees, human, human judgment. So Twitter may block the person in Romania, not picking on Romania, who's trying to log into your Twitter account. They may say, hey, this IP address doesn't match Chicago. Let's, uh, let's alert a fraud, um, a fraud alert. So my, my question is, uh, is there a middle ground for programmable money where we can have the secure, ultra, Where we can have the ultra secure security that well, where we can have the ultra secure network that blockchains offer, and <coughs> combine that with the ease of use and the good fraud detection and what everybody already uses, which is social media, can we find a good middle ground? 
people have tried to do this before, most notably uh, a company called Change Tip, um, which facilitated Bitcoin tips. They were around before Ethereum via centralized bots on social media platforms like Reddit, Twitter, etc. If you've been around, you may have heard of Change Tip. Um, transactions with Change Tip weren't on chain, but they were in Change Tip's database, and then it, after some amount of time, you can settle up with Change Tip, and they might pay you out of crypto. So that was good, but it was certainly centralized, and we can do better. A potential solution that I'm going to present today is to use smart contract smart contracts and Oracle services, where an Oracle service, uh, for those who don't know, is a service that queries the regular old web, um, a regular website like twitter.com, and inputs that information into um, a blockchain. And um, that's a third party, um, but Oracle's a, a particular service has purportedly devised a method to do this in a secure manner. So my potential solution, Ethereum smart contracts relying on oracleize.it to prove ownership of online accounts. All right, you guys may be wondering what's going on. So this is, uh, this is a web app that I've developed running on my computer. It's not online yet. Um, but what we can do here, and what you see here is these tweet wallet balances. So we have this demo ETH user 6120. That user doesn't have a balance of any ether. Um, we have another user, 4343. Uh, the user with this Twitter uh, account name has a balance of 0 0.03 Ether in there. This is running on the test, the test net, the Ethereum test net. Um, so if this user can prove that he or she owns this twi Twitter username by posting something to Twitter, they can come back and claim that money. If we wanted to add somebody, we could we could do that here. We could say, well, I want to offer some money to Conrad. We could press this button, and I won't do it because it will take a little while, but this will create a new contract on the Ethereum network. And then you can send money to this contract. So it would pop up down here, Conrad, with a new address. And you can send money to this long address here. And um, then Conrad would be able to claim those tips. So let's say we like this ETH user 6120. We'll send this user one ether and we'll sign this transaction using the in browser service called MetaMask. This will get broadcast to the Ethereum network. And in short order, we should see a balance of one Ether on that contract. So what I've hooked up to here is a third party service, a third party website, what's, uh, which queries the testnet Ethereum blockchain. And we see that that transaction went through, one Ether, and it's still impending. The blocks need to be added and needs to go through a confirmation process. When it's confirmed, it will update on the web application. And it's still confirmed. This happens to be a Twitter username that I have access to. And if I wanted to claim these funds, which will shortly be in that account, then I need to compose a tweet that follows this precise formula. I need to first paste the Ethereum address of the contract that I'm trying to access. I'm saying, I want the money that's in, in this um, address here. And then secondly, paste the address of the Ethereum address that you want, to, you want the money to be paid out to. So Conrad might have ownership of a, an account, I might have ownership of an account, and I want the money to go to that account. So let's see if the transaction went through. It did. We should be able to refresh this page and see that the balance of that Ethereum address is now one ETH. 
And so this uh, web app is querying data, again, from the Robson uh, blockchain. And incidentally, this is uh, the address of the parent contract. For the techies out there, this follows the factory pattern, and so a new contract is created every time we create another tweet, develop another potential reward. Good, the uh, transfer went through, and now at this address is this balance of ether, one ether. Let's confirm that there actually is one ether on that address, on that website, etherscan. Indeed, there is uh, one ether, uh, one ether in that contract. So, I am ETH user 6120. Um, I have some tips, I have some payments. Maybe I've sent money to this contract myself because I don't trust myself to be able to manage my own private keys. For whatever reason, I want to claim the money's in there, and now I want to get it. And so we have this address here, ending in 69D. Here's the address ending in 69D. And we see that it currently has about one ether. We haven't claimed it yet. When we claim this, these funds, what should happen, knock on wood, is that that will go to two people. <coughs> so, with Twitter, every tweet has a unique status. And so we're gonna copy this status right here. And we're gonna submit a claim to the Ethereum network. Everything looks right, I think. This, this is my Twitter username, this is the address of the contract and I submit this claim um, to the Ethereum network. Let's give it a lot of gas and make sure this goes through. So now this is doing a lot of work, actually. What's going on now is that we took that status ID, this status ID, and we sent it to the Ethereum smart contract. The Ethereum smart contract is um, taking this information and concatenating it all together in one long URL that has the Twitter username of uh, my Twitter username or whoever's playing with money. Then what's going to happen is Oracleize, we're going to send it Oracleize, which is a third party service that's doing, uh, that's getting money, that's getting data from outside the blockchain and inputting in the, into the blockchain. Oracleize is for fee going to query that Twitter URL and get the data that I tweeted out here. So it's gonna get this data and return it to the smart contract. The smart contract is then gonna um, parse this information and make sure that this matches up, make sure that this is a valid address, and then send the money to this address. So if all goes right, um, by now or shortly, we should see this balance We should see this balance go to zero because it's now been claimed, it's now been paid out. And then we should see this account go to around two. Good. So we got our money, we claimed it successfully, and when this data returns, this should populate with around zero. Maybe to refresh one more time. So I'm not sure why people would want to use this. I mean, <laughs> but uh, it's been pretty educational, and thankfully uh, that did work. So we have a uh, balance of zero ether there. So that's the demo. Um, just some few remarks in conclusion, and I can either take questions or we can move on.
challenges of privacy, maybe people don't want to share how much money they're getting, whatever. Um, another challenge is that Oracleize is a trusted third party. Um, the use of oracles remains just the big question in crypto. How do we take information from outside of the blockchain and put it into the blockchain in a trust-minimized fashion? Um, social media accounts are often trusted third parties. But instead of just using your one Twitter account, what if we could do something where, hey, I want to spend some money, um, and it's a big purchase. Maybe we could do something like, well, I need authorization from Twitter. I need authorization from my Google Plus. I need authorization from my Facebook, or whatever else people use. It can be any URL, any website that you have ownership over. And uh, for a small transaction, you might only require one of those approvals. For a large transaction, you might require more. Um, another challenge that SSL TLS or TLS notary proofs, which are the cryptographic proof that Oracleize purportedly uses to get information from outside the outside world and input it into the blockchain in a trust minimized fashion, TLS notary proofs. Very, very difficult to understand. You have to be a cryptographic expert to understand what's going on. That, that's a difficulty. Uh, finally, uh, basic technical implementation challenges and smart contract development is significant. And um, there's a lot of stuff that could have gone wrong in that demo that I'm thankful did not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's some of the tools that I used uh, um, while developing, uh, namely the Truffle fr framework, which helps you uh, combine the, the front end, what you saw on the screen there, with, uh, with the Ethereum network. Um, Oracleizes the Oracle service, um, a development environment that Oracle offers, the Go Ethereum client, MetaMask, which is that thing that showed up with the pop up that you can sign transactions with, and uh, EtherScan for third party verification of transactions. So, uh, a quick recap the basic idea is a vision where the probabilistic solutions to private key management using Oracles and trusted, already trusted, already used sources of online identity can offer a compromise between ultra-secure blockchains and ease of use for the average, the average person. So this code is open source. You can find it on GitHub there. You can find me here and on Twitter. And um, thank you very much. By the way, is uh, Nicole Villa here yet? So uh, I guess we have time for questions, because so, as of now, there's only three presenters. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So what other, I mean, it, it seems like you're, you're thinking rather uh, um, laterally here, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of like, the, I think a lot of people were sort of trying to bash what they wanted Ethereum to do into the Ethereum blockchain for quite some time. It's becoming clear from a lot of folks, you know, with business cases that, you know, the performance and the cost per transaction, other things like that just aren't quite there yet. Have you thought about anything analogous to that with oracles? So you mentioned how the, you know, the, the TLS proofs are, are, are tough, to, tough to implement. I mean, do you think that there are, are better ways of, you know, essentially aligning information to jump that boundary so that we can kind of close that performance gap a little bit? Um, yeah, I think so. I think, uh, so, um, you can input data into any blockchain. Uh, um, any person can do that. Yeah. I think the question is uh, how to input data in like um, a machine repeatable way. So uh, you know, if if I trusted you, I could just as easily use you as an oracle here and say, um, yeah, demo ETH user sixty one twenty did indeed tweet this, and therefore I'm going to authorize a transaction. It's going to go to where wherever demo ETH user, whatever wanted to, uh, where he or she wanted the money. So um, uh, I think that uh, whoever can discover a machine repeatable Oracleize service, which is what Oracleize it is trying to do, uh, will be really valuable. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question at all. I was just curious if you ever thought of yeah. you know different different approaches than what they had used. Uh -huh. I think, yeah, so I think one thing that I think would be interesting, which I was maybe going to put in the uh, presentation, was something like a lottery-based Oracle service, 
where you could have uh, a pool of 100 different oracles. Sure. And you might only select one of them, or you might randomly select several of them for any one or And, you know, this may, maybe really zero knowledge proofs, too, where you, yeah. you know. But uh, so any, some type of combination of lottery based oracles and zero knowledge proofs uh, might be cool, but I haven't right. thought about that enough. Well, I mean, it's really just trying to get to like, you know, number of nines behind the decimal of certainty of whether right. or not something is. That's right. Yeah. 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 I, never, yeah. I mean, one thing that I think would be interesting, uh, and it might not make sense for Ethereum, but you could build a blockchain system like Ethereum where the default client that you install has some limited ability to yeah. ping websites. Mm -hmm. And so basically, when, uh, when it validates blocks, it, uh, it checks whether a certain website exists or, or has the right value. And, uh, and then somehow you build in some system where like, as long as you know, like the majority agrees, the blockchain, I mean, you could do interesting things that way. Yeah, the problem is you get it very quick into uh, indeterminate behavior, uh, that, that, and you have to avoid that with the blockchain system. But I, I bet some competitors to Ethereum are probably gonna start doing things like that. So that you, you actually just have the blockchain pull in the data directly. Uh, but it gets really messy very quickly to do that. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for whoever can come up with easy way to do that. Yeah. When you were reloading this page, you know, it was taking a little while to query the information. Yep. What's the slowest part in that chain of events? Uh, probably just uh, sloppy code. To be with you. <laughs> uh, I think uh, if I just uh, work on that, it'd probably be a lot quicker. Probably in the order to of, uh, you know, five or ten times quick, quicker. Um, are, are you processing the query for every row in that table? Uh, yeah, yeah. asynchronously. Yeah, so so I mean, probably the way you would want to head is towards using the event uh, uh, and log system. Right. And then you could do it all in, in a single shotgun uh, approach. Right. Like grab all the data with an index log and then do some like post-processing on the client right. to filter out the stuff that's out of date mm -hmm. or something like that. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Yep. Um, just a clarification. I actually sign your transaction then? Does there is the private key with them? I guess maybe I don't I just don't quite under grasp that. Like how does the how is it that I'm sending Ethereum to you using Oracleize? Where is the my private key has to be involved in some way, shape or form, right, to make that happen. Right? And you're you're saying your point was that you offload your handling of private keys to someone else. So where where are the private keys involved? Yeah, so um, I guess uh, the, the Contrary to like to Bitcoin, you can have uh, con contract controlled uh, funds. So you can send money straight to a contract, and then that contract will um, has logic that can determine when that money is paid out. So the contract doesn't really have private keys, right? I mean, it's just the, the logic of the contract is, is what's paying out. And um, Oracleize uh, triggers a, a callback function in um, an Ethereum smart contract. And um, from there, the, queries, the query is going out. It's a little bit um, convoluted how, how it actually works in practice. But um, I guess maybe the best answer is that there is no private key with the funds that we're sending to the contract. That's contract controlled money. And so the, the logic of the contract, which you can't change you know, ever really, is, is controlling when that money is, is sent out. The, a, a smart contract doesn't need private keys, and it's kind of counterintuitive why it wouldn't, but the way Ethereum is designed, they function without private keys. Uh, however, what the, uh, the contract is doing is it's verifying that the data is signed by Oracleize. So Oracleize is signing the data that's, making the, that's leading to the decision, and then the smart contract doesn't need a private key, but it uh, can execute an action based on the data. Uh, other questions? Yes? Question, you know, when you read about all these stories that people have told all this amount of money uh, in the uh, Ethereum network and that kind of stuff, explain how they block it and stop it from being distributed to the wrong people and things like that. Since explain how my contract would do that? Well, not your contract, but the whole Ethereum network. Right now, because there's many times that people have hacked the system. Right. So just... You know, okay. So... Uh, I think there's two versions of hacks with Ethereum. Uh, one version might be um, like 
poor, poor key management uh, like off the blockchain is what I would say. That is, somebody breaks into your house and steals your private keys and steals all your Ethereum. Uh, that's the, the one way to get hacked. And then the second way to get hacked is to find uh, a vulnerability in, in the contract, in the code that's being executed on this distributed system. Um, so for the, for the first solution, uh, which is the basic security that's been practiced for you know, many decades. Um, for the second solution is, uh, is ongoing. In other words, how to, how to create robust smart contracts. And uh, we're learning new, new things about that every day because there are new vulnerabilities and uh, new bugs found in the Ethereum network. So, um, but underneath all that is a uh, pretty mathematically sound um, proof that um, if your private keys are not stolen and you have ownership of a certain amount of money, you are very confident that, uh, that you can spend that money when you want to. And, hmm? Can you show me any uh, No, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I'd say uh, there's several. We can talk later, I just want to see you. Yeah, sure. There is. Uh, so, you know, the same technology that uh, the internet is based off of um, underpins a lot of, same cryptography, underpins a lot of these crypto-based systems. Um, so, it's very difficult to understand. over the last uh, a few months uh, talking to health companies uh, and sort of trying to figure out where and how uh, blockchain tech could be useful in this space. And uh, it's still pretty early and there's a lot of, uh, like there's a, a lot of different approaches uh, that people are taking right now. And there's uh, still a lot of like uncertainty about which approach is gonna win out. Um, and I just kind of wanted to cover some of the, the like the main things that I see that are important in this space. Um, uh, but before that, um, I just wanted to mention something funny that happened to me earlier today. So, uh, so there's so there's this um, uh, obscure rock band that I'm kind of a fan of, and um, I, uh, uh, I I wanted to do. Uh, they, they, it's been taking them forever to come out with a new album, so I, I wanted to give them a little donation. And, uh, and, and so I, sent, I send them an email saying, hey, I want to donate some money so that you guys can record some music. Um, and uh, uh, they, uh, and, I, and, and, and in the email I said, well, I can send you either US dollars or I could send you Ethereum. And here was the, the email they sent back. Uh, so they said, uh, wow, this is very nice of you, thank you. And then they say, uh, Dave and I discussed that we would think the best thing would be for you to make a smart contract for us in Ethereum that gets released when we release the three songs that we're in the middle of recording. Uh, that way Nathan will have an incentive to finish his vocals and I'll finish my recording. And hopefully if the amount appreciates in the meantime, if you give it to us now, at least three of the guys would want fiat immediately. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, if you guys want to talk with me later about uh, how exactly uh, it would make sense to implement this, uh, uh, I would, I would love to hear it. So um, uh, uh, since this is recorded, uh, and I've you know, I'll probably still do some blog posts on this. I'll keep the name of the band uh, unknown, but they're, they're like super obscure. And, and I'm not just saying that because I want to sound like a hipster. They're really, they're really <laughs> obscure. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I've talked to a lot of people in the healthcare space about blockchain technology. Um, and um, uh, so, so uh, and there's like challenges with that. And I think, uh, at the end of the day, the like the core challenge is that um, 
uh, uh, IT, the way we, we handle data in, in uh, IT is still uh, very much based in a sort of a pre-internet world. And, uh, and, and in a pre-internet world, uh, uh, handling data in a company was very simple. Uh, you collect the data, and then um, because the internet doesn't exist, there's only one place you can put that data. You can put it into a, a database. And so, so there was a ver it was very clear. You collect data, where do you put it? You put it in a database. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and, and this kind of view of data, uh, especially in medicine, which is very conservative, has kind of persisted into the internet age. And, um, uh, and part of this, part of the reason it keeps persisting like this is the, the same sort of thinking that always goes on in the NSA, you know, where they, uh, anytime the NSA collects data, what do you do? You, you put a stamp on it that says it's top secret. And then all of a sudden, all this data that they collect isn't useful because nobody's allowed to look at it. Um, and and th this is the same situation. If we put our data in a siloed database inside of our company, we can't get fired because uh, you know, we were too open with our information. Um, and so, um, so this is kind of the world that I think, in general, uh, we have to get out of and where blockchain plays a role. Uh, now, now how, how is the world different now that there's the internet? Well, the, 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 the way it's different is that we have to start thinking about uh, um, the fact that uh, when we have data, there are certain types of data that uh, we want only a few people to be able to read. There's other type of data that we want many people to be able to read. And similarly, uh, there are some types of data we want only a few people to be able to write, and other types of data that we want many people to be able to write. So once you're dealing with an internet where you have large amounts of people, you need to, you can kind of make this matrix of, of different types of data. And the idea here is basically that that um, uh, if we that, 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 that different types of data have different requirements in terms of how you want to share it and, and how what kind of privacy you want. And that should change where you store that. So, you, so there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, which is that we just stick everything in the database. And I, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, 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 radiology uh, 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 vendors, and uh, the, there are systems out there where uh, you go into the hospital, and, and if you enter in a patient's blood pressure, you use a, a, a certain software system. And then if, if uh, an inspector comes and inspects a piece of radiology equipment, what do they, they do? They go to the exact same terminal and they enter in the inspection report and it goes into the exact same database. So the inspection report for a piece of equipment and the patient's blood pressure, just is, it's all just data, right? We just stick it in the database. Um, and and uh, so, so that, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so, so, so what sort of fits into these different categories? Well, there's definitely, um, uh, in medicine, there's uh, HIPAA-sensitive patient data. So this is uh, data that, from a legal standpoint, has to be protected, um, uh, that, that relate, that's uh, sensitive, that, that's patient data. And clearly, uh, you want few people to be able to read that data, and you want only very few people to be able to write that data. Um, so no, you know, so, so there's no question on that. Um, uh, but now there's, there's other pieces of data. Uh, you know, obviously there's communications like email. So, so uh, communications information, you want uh, anyone to really be able to send an email into a company. Uh, but then you want very strict rules for who uh, can read that, infor that information. So this is, this is a type of data that only uh, appeared once the internet existed. Um, and then uh, another type of data is social media. So you as a company, uh, there, there's data out there about your company that, that, that anyone can write uh, uh, and anyone can read. And this is basically things like ratings and uh, uh, you know, reviews of, of your products. And this is now an, another form of data that you have to think about. Uh, and then there's the last square. So this is the square that uh, many people, you want many people to be able to read this information but you want very few people to be able to write it. You want very strong write controls over that data. So this is kind of a weird uh, uh, space. Um, and, and what belongs in there is things like uh, registries. So things like uh, license registries for doctors, equipment registries, and then things like supply chain data, such as you know, uh, following a chemical that's used for a pharmaceutical through the supply chain and making sure uh, 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 you know uh, what the different parties are that it came through. So this is all data. Uh, you know, if, if you have a, a registry of medical licenses, 
you want to be very, very clear who is allowed to write that data. Um, and there have to be very strict and very complicated rules for uh, uh, making alterations to the licensing data. But you want uh, anybody to be able to read that. So, so uh, the medical licenses are a public piece of data. And the more open they, they're available, the better it is uh, for that information. Um, and this field right here, uh, in, in my view, is, is the one where, where blockchain is, is the ideal solution. So, so a blockchain, if, uh, by, by its nature, blockchain does not prevent anyone from writing, uh, from reading the data in a blockchain. Anyone can download the Ethereum or Bitcoin blockchain and see the entire history of all accounts that have ever existed. But the place where you do have, um, where you do need very strong security is around who's allowed to alter those records. So you don't want people to be able to move a uh, million dollars out of a uh, Ethereum account if they don't own that Ethereum account. And similarly, we can build a system where uh, only uh, uh, specific employees in the government are allowed to update a medical license. Um, and uh, so, so this is uh, uh, what I think is like the, the, the easiest opportunity in, in medicine for uh, uh, blockchain technology. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, at some point I'm going to give a longer demo of, our, of, our, uh, uh, of the products we're working on. Uh, but uh, this right here is our, uh, one of our products, the, uh, the higher uh, licensing system. And, and we've, we've been developing this with, with uh, communication with the uh, Illinois Department of uh, uh, Financial and Professional Regulation. Uh, it, has, it has lots of features. I'm not gonna, uh, this is a short demo, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, but, uh, 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 but basically what it does is it uses a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, right now just on a test network. Um, and it, and the, the smart contract knows uh, who the employees are in, in the government, who the employees are at specific uh, schools and uh, continuing education, other continuing education providers that, are, that give courses to doctors and other medical providers. And it knows, uh, of course, who has administrator rights in the system. And, uh, and so uh, what, if we want to perform any action having to do with the medical license, um, uh, we have to digitally sign it uh, using the traditional Ethereum uh, uh, signing protocol for transactions. And then the smart contract will verify that that signature uh, uh, belongs to somebody who has the rights to perform the action that it's trying to perform. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so you can do lots of stuff with this software, but what I'm gonna do right now is just show you what happens when we add a provider. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so basically I'm now functioning in the role of a government processor. Uh, somebody just moved into the state of Illinois and uh, filled out their paperwork to have uh, a license in the state of Illinois. And I'm gonna now um, enter in their license uh, uh, ID and uh, their name. Uh, uh, let's just call that uh, Roger uh, Smith. Uh, just in case there is a Roger. Something else there, okay. Because um, I already have uh, uh, existing records in there. Um, oh. So this is very similar to Tony's app. Um, you know, we hit submit. Uh, we're using MetaMask, and a MetaMask transaction window pops up. Um, so now I'm digitally signing as an employee of the state of Illinois that this person is uh, should have a, has a valid respiratory therapy license. Uh, after I hit submit, um, it's now uh, being uh, sent to the network. We're waiting for confirmation uh, that the uh, the block was mine, um, which. Uh, should happen shortly. Let's um, look in here. There we go. Transaction succeeded. Um, and now, uh, if we go back to the search screen, uh, we can look for Smith. And um, let's see if Roger Smith is in here. Like I think it's supposed to be. Um, well. Let me try one refresh. We might have a little uh, demo glitch here. Yeah, 
yeah, there they are. Don't know what happened there. So Roger Smith. Um, and uh, you know, this again, this is all on a public blockchain, just like Tony did. We can now go to uh, EtherScan. We can look at the raw public data, um, and we can look at the smart contract. Uh, and you can see that one minute ago, somebody submitted a new uh, uh, license in the system. So I just wanted to just quickly show uh, uh, an act what we're actually working on. And, and uh, uh, at some point, uh, I'll probably give a longer talk to talk about the technical challenges of building these types of systems. Um, and then just real quick, um, uh, the thing that everybody, of course, talks to us about the moment we start writing about medicine and blockchain is, well, what, what every company really wants to do is they want to put medical data patient data on, on a public blockchain. So they want to do this stuff, right? And the problem with that is, is that um, in order to come up with a decent way to, to privately and securely store patient data in a blockchain, there's like maybe uh, six or seven different properties your system has to have in order for it to be useful. And you can come up with lots of different systems that uh, fall short on some of those six or seven properties. Um, and so you're, you're always in this conversation where you say, "Oh, well, probably we can't put it on the uh, we can't put it on a public blockchain because uh, you know it's a HIPAA violation." And they say, uh, "Oh, well, we can encrypt it." And then you say, "Well, yeah, but if you encrypt it, then you can't do anything useful with the data because you need to uh, uh, you want to run smart contracts against it." And then they say, "Well, you know, you can use zero knowledge proofs." Um, and then and then it just kind of keeps on going forever and ever in sort of a circle. Um, uh, uh, and, and so I figured just. Just to, I, I would just kind of briefly go over what are the different options. How could you build a, a blockchain uh, that uh, can handle uh, pr uh, private patient data and actually be useful in a larger context? And I can come up with eight different uh, approaches. And a lot of these, uh, there are companies that are doing these. Um, and so far, I'm not really convinced that any of them are that useful. Um, so, so yeah. So the most obvious one everybody says is, oh, well, if if uh, if it's patient data, uh, why don't we just use Ethereum and we just encrypt the data before we put it in there? So, uh, so the pros of of using uh, Ethereum and just putting encrypted patient data on there is it has great availability. So if you put somebody's blood pressure on the blockchain, uh, you know, chances are 100 years from now you'll still be able to uh, get that data, and it's very simple. So uh, you know all the technology for this exists. We can do this today. Um, the problem, of course, is a horrible, horrible scalability. You, you can store only a tiny amount of data um, uh, in a cost-effective way on the Ethereum blockchain. You can run smart contracts against the data. So the whole promise of Ethereum and of blockchain technology is to build intelligent data. And you can't have intelligent data if your computer program can't read the data. Uh, and then the third problem is, you're, you still need a decryption key. Where is this decryption key going to be? You can't put that on the blockchain. It's going to have to be in a traditional server somewhere. And more importantly, if you have a, a patient record that's encrypted using a decryption key uh, or an encryption key, then um, uh, you're probably going to want multiple parties to be able to read that data, and you're going to have to pass that decryption key around multiple parties. And that's kind of a no-no in, uh, in uh, cryptography. Uh, you want everybody to have their own key and to never, ever, ever transmit a, a, uh, a, a, a cryptography key to another party. Uh, we want to use something like public key encryption uh, or, or some other mechanism. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so that's the problem with using public chain encryption to try to solve this. The second one is private chain. So why don't we just uh, have a clone of the Ethereum network, we stick it into a hospital, and then um, uh, we just make sure there's a firewall so nobody uh, who's not allowed to can access it, and then we just put all the uh, data in there. So this can this can work, and I think there might be value in doing it. It has good scalability because you have a blockchain for every hospital or whatever. Um, and smart contracts are easy because uh, uh, you can just uh, uh, in the, in the actual hospital the smart contract can read all the data, so you can do really interesting things. Uh, the problem is you haven't really solved the, the the goal, which is one of the goals, which is to make uh, the data available. Uh, uh, to, to legitimate parties that are not inside the hospital. So this isn't really a good way of sharing data, uh, even when, when you want to share data. Um, then there's problems with data availability and auditability. So um, you know, if, if you just have like two servers in the data center of the hospital maintaining the blockchain, if, those, uh, you know, if, the, if there's a fire or uh, somebody accidentally uh, trips over a core, then, then your data might be gone. Um, and then the, the, the other problem is, is 
you would probably want different computers in the hospital, the nursing stations, to, to also be nodes that participate in this blockchain. And, uh, and so now you have to have special uh, hardened uh, hardware devices. You don't want somebody just to be able to walk up to a nursing station, stick in a USB stick, and download the blockchain. So, so, so we don't really have any good, I mean, people have built hardened PCs, but not for this particular use case. I mean, and there's work that remains from a development standpoint. The next one is consortium chains. So this is instead of uh, having one uh, company running a private chain, you have 10 companies that all participate on a chain, and they all, they all sign legal contracts or something where they promise not to divulge the data in an illegal way. And so now you have privacy, uh, and you, you don't have a single point of failure anymore. So this has good scalability still, uh, good uh, availability and auditability, because um, one party out of the pen can't uh, mess around with the data or lose the data. Um, but it's not really clear that this meets HIPAA guidelines. Because if I'm, if I'm sh uh, sharing a blockchain with another hospital, because we're part of the consortium, uh, employees in another hospital can look at my patient data, and, and like HIPAA does not like that. Um, uh, so so, so there's, that's one challenge. Another problem is, is the whole reason why companies usually like to keep data secret, besides just the legal issue around patient privacy, is that they don't want their competitors to, to, to have access to certain data. They don't want to know how many widgets you sold or how many patients you have or how much you, you get reimbursed for a particular procedure. Um, so, so if you build a consortium, then you're basically uh, the exact people who are going to have all your data are your competitors. So that's not that great. Um, and then just in general, lots of people have, in theory, have access to the data. Anyone uh, of the consortium partners that's uh, uh, an employee that's working on the system can access the data. The next one is fire-like systems. So, uh, so fire is a protocol where you have a, uh, a, a database that has a um, basically an authentication mechanism. So, so there's a database, it has uh, a traditional database, it has patient data in it. And then when somebody wants to ask for that data, uh, there's an authentication mechanism that says, hey, is this person allowed to read John Smith's uh, radiology report? Um, and, uh, uh, and so you could imagine building a, a fire-like system where the blockchain uh, just acts for permissions management. So, so basically, uh, you know, just telling whether a certain doctor is allowed to look at a certain record in a certain hospital. Um, and then you just put the actual uh, sensitive data on traditional databases behind a regular firewall and all that. So this has fantastic scalability because all the data is just running on regular servers. Um, and then it's nice that it's inherently very decentralized because uh, each one of these servers is um, um, uh, a, uh, uh, basically anyone can add a new server into the system and they're all independent. Um, the problem is the system is complex um, uh, because now you have two layers. You have these servers, and then you also have the blockchain component. And then the problem, then another problem is like the system is kind of use useless because I have to know that John Smith had a radiology report, or otherwise I don't know to look for it in the server. So I have to put something on the public blockchain, just some kind of cookie that lets me know that there's something useful for John Smith, and that in itself is probably already uh, uh, illegal. Um, and then in general, if we're gonna use traditional s databases anyway uh, to hold the actual data, why not just ask them uh, if uh, John Smith has a radiology report? Why do we need a blockchain at all? So these are, these are difficult uh, questions. And there might be some use cases where this still makes sense. The next one is a Factum-like system. So Factum is a, uh, uh, an early uh, blockchain uh, uh, system. And what they deal with is mainly proof of existence. So you have documents, and all you care about with those documents is do they exist? So can we, can we prove that there's a document with a certain hash um, you know, that, that relates to John Smith that happened two months ago, and, uh, and all the blockchain does is just store that hash so that we know that there, there's like a, a record in existence. So it's good for scalability because the actual data itself is stored in a traditional database again. It has a good, good uh, great audit trail. Um, it, but the main problem is, is it, it has, um, complex app development issues. Because now, uh, with this type of system, anyone can publish a proof of existence. So I can say, uh, you know, John Smith had, had this report, and I can put that on the public Ethereum blockchain. Um, and there's no, there's no filter to say, well, you're not really somebody 
who knows anything about John Smith or, or should be able to report that they had a radiology report. So the way you build something with a factum-like system is you have a very complicated client application that sits on top of the, uh, the, the blockchain that like know that keeps track of like who is a valid authority to make attestations about uh, people in the system. And then it, it knows that some of those uh, things about uh, this patient uh, are invalid because they, they're, they don't have a valid signature key that, that you recognize. So, so it, may, it puts a lot of work on the app developer to keep track of like what's legitimate data. And also uh, the smart contracts, uh, uh, you can't do any decentralized smart contracts because all the actual data is, in a cent uh, is at a centralized party. Uh, the next one is zero knowledge systems. So this is, uh, I, I can't really go into this in detail, but the, this is kind of the ultimate dream in uh, handling uh, patient data uh, uh, private data on a uh, public blockchain. And the idea, uh, this is oversimplifying it, but the idea is you take the patient data, you encrypt it, and then you take the actual algorithm that you're gonna run against that patient data. It's in the form of a smart contract, but you encrypt that too. So now you have an encrypted piece of data and an encrypted program that runs against the encrypted data, but you actually run all of that uh, on a public uh, computer, so on, on, a, on the public, Ethereum blockchain, and, and then it, give, it spits out an encrypted result. So everything is secret, but, but uh, it all runs in a, a public environment. Everything is validated. Uh, all the rules are validated in a public environment, but nobody can actually see what's happening. So, so, so there are some zero knowledge systems that people have built that actually work for limited applications. The most well-known one is called Zcash, which is an anonymous uh, 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 blockchain for uh, 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 does currency, um, uh, and you could apply this same technology to medical records. Um, and, and it's also simple in, in that it just uses a regular blockchain, aside from the encryption. Uh, and that's where the problem is. So uh, there's probably about 50 people or something in the world that are competent enough to actually write software that uses zero knowledge proofs because they're like uh, extremely uh, mathematically complex. Um, and, uh, and, and the performance on, on these systems is uh, really bad. The encryption is, is a very uh, com computationally intensive. Uh, and finally, um, it has, there's many constraints in terms of when uh, zero knowledge proof is possible and when it's not. And so it's hard for me as a non-expert to evaluate, but it may not actually uh, be flexible enough for, for medicine. And then the last one is uh, called plasma chains. So there was, if you go to Ethereum Research, uh, that's the name of the website, it's .ch, so the um, research, the last two letters, uh, CH, are uh, uh, at the end. If you go there, Vitalik, uh, like a couple of days ago, posted a minimal viable uh, plasma chain uh, uh, white paper uh, uh, implementation uh, and description. Um, and this is uh, basically a chain that you could run alongside Ethereum um, that, uh, where, where you could uh, very cheaply do calculations. And in theory, also have some limited privacy. and. Um, and it, it, it inherits a lot of the properties of a public blockchain, um, but is, is lower cost, and in theory, at least, can have some limited privacy. Um, uh, the main uh, problems with it are, number one, uh, poor data availability. So with a uh, plasma system, there's a mechanism for punishing uh, uh, the, uh, the maintainers of the plasma chain. Uh, so there'll be like a pool of people that would maintain that plasma chain. You can punish them if they, um, uh, in some ways, if they uh, stop like producing new blocks or produce false blocks, but um, but there's but but it's really limited. If if if, if somebody just uh, shuts down the plasma chain and stops uh, handing out the data, there's ways for data to get lost uh, or, or uh, so that people can't access it anymore. So so that doesn't make it great if you're trying to uh, put medical data on there. Uh, they're very complicated. Um, they have large fixed costs in that um, you, have to, uh, you have to write very complicated Ethereum smart contracts on the public chain uh, to make plasma chains work, and there's a lot of overhead when people interact with the, uh, uh, the system. Um, and, and as of now, there's no actual implementation of this yet, though it looks promising. Um, the final main problem for patient data is that it still may not meet all HIPAA requirements. So essentially what you're doing is you're gonna run all the, the, the uh, you're gonna uh, analyze uh, uh, medical records 
uh, in this private chain. So you might you know, try to figure out if a patient is at risk of some disease. Uh, and then if, if the people maintaining the, that private chain uh, do something malicious, you can uh, do some stuff on the public chain where you can punish them, uh, force them to have a uh, deposit that they place uh, slash so that you can produce financial incentives that people will properly maintain this private chain. The problem is when you do that, when you, uh, when you basically uh, have an arbitration and you complain that somebody is doing something wrong on the private chain, you have to divulge at least a small part of the calculation that you claim they did incorrectly. So, uh, so if, if the mistake on the private chain is that somebody, somebody said that uh, somebody's blood pressure was above 140 when it was really under 140, you would have to give at least that tiny piece of data, uh, uh, divulge that on the public chain in order to punish that bad actor. And that may already be a, a HIPAA violation. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, well then the final one, this isn't really serious, is maybe we should just all uh, let our health records be public. Uh, that would solve all the problems, uh, so uh, in terms of scalability, and, uh, uh, and we could, re you know, in theory it could revolutionize medicine. If, if medical data was more available and everybody uh, could uh, run machine learning against all of our data. Uh, the problem, of course, is, is that uh, you know, your, your uh, employer could uh, like, uh, uh, discriminate against you because you have some disease. And then, of course, there's a million uh, Black Mirror-style dystopias that do have to do with all of us knowing way too much about each other. Uh, but but uh, yeah, it's something to think about anyway. Uh, anyway, that's my presentation. Um, uh, yeah. uh, is Nicole here yet? Oh, uh, it's Andrew. I'm here. And yes, you're here. Great. So we. Uh, so yes. So our, our final presenter is here, Andrew. Oh, do you want to take any questions? Oh yeah, I think we have a little time now because we we had four talks, but one person didn't show up. Uh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, well, second. I saw a video recently about Estonia having really advanced technology as far as um, citizen data, including healthcare. How do they handle the healthcare and data? Is it open record for the, in the government, and then it's just distributed out, or do you know the details of that? Uh, I don't know about Estonia uh, in general. Okay. Uh, I do know that they're doing something where they're keeping track of uh, citizen IDs on, on a public blockchain, maybe even the Ethereum public blockchain, or at least they have a pilot project. So that's very similar to what our company is doing with medical licenses. And in that case, uh, privacy isn't an issue because uh, the, the system is, uh, has some public uh, aspect to it. I, I haven't heard about the one where they're dealing with patient data, so I don't know about that. To that point, I think they have forked the Ethereum blockchain and are using that uh, in, a, in a separate development. Yeah. You know, uh, separate. Yes. Yes, just thank you very much. Secondary presentation here about health records in the abstract. And I, uh, it's a fascinating problem. I'd just like to comment. It's very similar to uh, in a way the census problem, the census of manufacturers and things like this, where, where the government collects all this data about companies and then it, it's, it has to be aggregated to a certain level. Where I mean, the, the problem is, is that, uh, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've spent uh, 14 years working at a large medical company, and, and I know what it means when, like, a large company anonymizes patient data. And from, from somebody who's a computer science person, it's rather laughable in terms of, like, if, if you know, if, if you put uh, out uh, so, somebody's entire medical history and just, like, uh, change their name into a number, uh, that is not what I would consider uh, anonymization. Um, and that's uh, wh when you deal with these things, that's often what they're doing. Uh, so, so, uh, so it's a good question. Can you really anonymize patient data where you can uh, mathematically prove that there's no way of recovering the original data? And I think once you get to that point, then you're basically doing what, one of the uh, solutions I described, which is a zero knowledge proof. Uh, so one system you could do with zero knowledge proofs relative, yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there must be some middle ground where uh, uh, we can somehow uh, change people's data enough so that it's still useful, 
but uh, not so much that they can't be identified, but it's, uh, it's a tough question. Or some regulatory regime, quite frankly. I think that the efficiencies offered by stuff like this really ought to be used as a pressure on legislators to allow for more, you know, essentially revolutionary practices in medicine or, you know, government contracting data or other things like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's modifications probably to the HIPAA law that could be made that wouldn't in any material way affect patient privacy, but would like give enough of a, uh, a, a wiggle room where you could apply much more uh, powerful technology. Like especially what I was talking about with fraud proofs. Yeah. Like if you, if you have this system, this private data system, and you have to like in a public forum say, hey, this person uh, did an incorrect calculation on this patient, right. that there's some legal way that you're allowed to divulge what the incorrect calculation was. If you could just do that little piece, yeah. uh, it wouldn't really affect privacy in any meaningful way, and you could do lots of interesting things that way. Absolutely. One more question, and then we'll move on. Uh, there's a technology, atomic swaps, being developed like in a lightning network between cryptocurrencies. Is it possible in like a private chain or multiple private chains to utilize that technology? Yes, yeah, so plasma chains is, uh, uh, uses something called state channels which is uh, uh, technologically identical to uh, uh, atomic swaps in something like the Lightning Network. Okay. Uh, so it's the same technology. Uh, plasma change is sort of a more uh, extreme use of that technology. So it's the same idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So our next presentation is uh, by Andrew Page on uh, the uh, use, uh, basically talking about uh, the Howey uh, test for securities. All right, here you go. All right, uh, before I dive into this presentation, uh, I, I, have to, I have to tell you I'm not a lawyer and <laughs> this is not legal advice. So basically, what I'm going to be presenting to you today is my opinion about uh, legal topics that are of great importance to the entire Ethereum community, and where we've seen really important developments in the last month, basically, that uh, it's very easy to uh, lose uh, in, in this community because everything moves so quickly, but it's worth talking about them um, because, because they're very, very important, uh, both as the, from, the perspective, from the perspective of an investor and also from the perspective of somebody who might want to offer um, some sort of token for, for sale now or in the future. So if there's one thing that, um, that uh, you could walk away from this presentation sort of remembering afterwards, it, it's, it's, that, it, it's, it's the Howey test. Uh, the Howey test, the background is, um, it comes from a SEC lawsuit 1946, uh, where Howie was basically selling uh, fractional investments uh, in an orange grove, where you could buy a small part of the orange grove, and then um, and then Howie, by, by charging a fee, would actually run the orange grove and then distribute the profits proportionally back to you, uh, based on on uh, how how many of these investment contracts you signed with him. And basically what ended up happening is the SEC uh, sued Howie, claiming that what, what he was doing was offering a, a, a security for sale, much like uh, a stock certificate that would trade on a uh, public stock exchange. And uh, the important part of this case for us is that uh, is the Howie test that, that came out of that lawsuit. So under the Howie test, uh, it's, it's, and something is, is, is a security if it's an investment of money with an expectation of profits where the investment is in a common enterprise and where the profits are derived from the efforts of that promoter or third party. So it's not your actions that are causing the value of your investment to appreciate. It's this company's or whatever it is that you're investing in. And 
basically from 1946 until the present, this is the, uh, this is the test that the SEC uses when it's looking at something new and it's trying to determine whether this thing is a security. Uh, and it's the same test that people in the Ethereum community should generally, uh, it's the standard that we should be holding things to if we're wondering that same question. Now, like, there's, there's, there's a whole rabbit hole in terms of the semantics here. Like money, what's money? Um, that's, that's a whole complicated thing on its own. Uh, we've seen in the last month that the SEC is willing to consider Ether money for the sake of this test, maybe not for other things. Like the IRS considers Ether property, as we learned during the tax presentation two months ago. But at least for the Howey test, uh, Ether can be money. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, common enterprise, we could have lots of debates about this. And in fact, there are, there are more advanced topics on this that we could talk about, like, uh, like, like private placements and the SAFT. But what I really want to emphasize in this test is stuff that's applicable to people who are just getting introduced to the Howey test and who are just investing in ICOs or considering it for the very first time and, and want, want to know what those risks are. Don't have imposter syndrome about this. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand the Howey test. Um, and uh, in, in fact, a lot of people should be making independent judgments about whether assets are securities uh, before they uh, participate in markets for those assets. And a lot of those people will not be lawyers. Um, but the, 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 the test itself is relatively simple. So even if you aren't a lawyer, you can be just about as expert on this as anybody else. Um, I, for the people who, who are just getting introduced to this topic, there, there are a number of, of reasons uh, for, for people uh, to argue, argue this, but there's a, there's a general consensus that Bitcoin is probably not a security and Ether is probably not a security. Uh, there are great articles on, uh, on Coindesk and uh, there's a great uh, person who works for, I think, Coin Center called Peter Van Valkenburg, who's published a really great analysis on this, specifically for Bitcoin and Ether. So if we want to go into that, um, those are some really great resources to, to draw on. But uh, at least since I'm here presenting my opinion to you and I'm not a lawyer, I'm going to say <laughs> that for the time being, Bitcoin and Ether are probably not securities. Um, can you just in like uh, two or three sentences say why they're not securities? Uh, a lot of it has to do with common enterprise um, and uh, a lot of it has to do with, uh, with, with immediate utility on the network for Ether. Uh, specifically, like uh, the fact that you can use Ether to pay for compute cycles um, for the equivalent gas uh, on the Ethereum network. Uh, and so um, it's not a pure investment contract, is what people generally seem to think. However, um, a lot of ICO tokens probably are securities under the Howard test. This is because they are uh, really a lot of tokens, or at least the way that, that tokens have been offered in 2017, uh, mirror this, the structure of public equities markets. You're investing in a company. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, you're investing in a company with an expectation of a profit, where the profits are derived from the efforts of that company. It's textbook power. Uh, however, those decisions are case by case. And at the end, I'm going to go through three examples, and two of those three are probably not illegal. So, um, <laughs> so there is, there is, uh, this isn't this isn't to say that if you come across an ICO, it's illegal. You you really should do your own analysis uh, and and look at specific details of every project and how they market themselves. Um, and then, you know, it's worth noting that there, there, there is a way to offer securities for sale in the United States um, with, without necessarily, you know, doing an IPO on 
NASDAQ that is still legal. Uh, and that is, uh, that there, there are ways of registering a security with the SEC. Um, however, a vast majority of uh, crypto projects in general and a vast majority of ICOs uh, are not registered with the SEC. So the enforcement action that the SEC would take would typically be uh, uh, because these companies are not registered. It, it, there, there could be other you know, misconduct that they're doing, but what the SEC is gonna say is you're not registered. Um, there's a really cool Google Doc that I think Coinbase put together last year, which is a, uh, a point-based system that you can use if you're like looking at something new. And um, let's see, oh, there we go. And basically, like you can, there are different questions about something that you're looking at, and then you get to a, a different amount of points based on the answer of those questions. And it can kind of give you a uh, general sense of what your level of risk is uh, as to whether those four parts of the Howey test are met. Um, so this is a cool resource. There's a lot of people looking at this right now. This thing has been in the public for a year. Um, it clearly, uh, it's useful. Uh, so so use it uh, if you if you uh, if, if this is of interest to you. Um, Oh yeah, so I did my own uh, calculation for first blood, and uh, those were the results that I came up with. But you know, your your conclusions might be different. Uh, but this is an example of how you could apply it to a project. All right, let's see. Um, it's also worth noting that selling an unregistered security to anybody is illegal. So these risks aren't just for people who are offering. Uh, who, who, are, who are creating tokens and offering them for sale to the public. There are also risks that uh, you have to assess from the investor perspective because, um, because selling an unregistered security to anybody is illegal. And if you're dealing with a uh, private placement, you still have to abide by laws for a private placement, which means you can only sell it to an accredited investor. So you have to make sure that, that your buyer, if you're going to sell this thing, is, is, is an accredited investor. Um, there are a couple other questions here that, that I, I think are, are relevant if you're going to sell an ICO that you should really consider uh, thinking about uh, from an investor perspective. So we've never seen up to this point, January 2018, a lawsuit against an ICO investor. But that's not to say that it would never happen uh, if somebody is uh, selling unregistered securities to other people. Okay, so I'm gonna run through three quick examples. Uh, it's worth noting that these examples all happened in the last month. Um, so that's, you know, this, this whole thing is, in, is, is evolving really quickly. Um, but yeah, remember, uh, it's an investment of money with an expectation of profits in a common enterprise where the profits are derived from the efforts of a third party. All right, so the first one is Munchie. Um, here's the token model for Munchie from their white paper. Basically, they are offering some sort of a token that could be useful uh, for rewards for visiting restaurants and you can exchange it for different things and restaurants can own it. But the token model actually isn't that important because um, Munchie developers may have argued that because you could do stuff like this, the token is a utility token, but their, um, their marketing was, 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 was pretty scary. So they said 199% gains on MUN token at the ICO price. Top 15 ICOs of all time. Speculated that a $1,000 investment could create a $90,000. That is expectation of a profit, right? Actually, this is almost as bad as offering a profit guarantee. Not quite as bad, but it's pretty bad. Um, and then, uh, 
you know, and on their blog, they said, as more users get on the platform, the more valuable your MUN tokens will become. Um, and MUN purchasers can watch their value increase over time. And they would, they would burn their own MUN tokens to increase that value. It was, anyways, it was a, a case of really egregious marketing. And from an outsider's perspective, I, I, I might think that that the SEC pursued an enforcement action against Munchie, which was actually filed on December 11th, so one month to the day from this presentation, uh, because this was so egregious. The SEC doesn't want to lose one of these very first lawsuits that it files against ICO promoters. Like it, it, it wants to, it wants every single case to be a slam dunk, and so. Why not wait until somebody uh, markets themselves like this and then pursue that one? <laughs> you know, let, let everybody else who's like relatively sane go, at least at the beginning, because you're definitely going to win this one. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's really what they were thinking. And so uh, I, the, the lesson to be learned from this probably is um, Marketing has a really big impact on these campaigns. And like, if you are a technical co-founder, your personal interpretation of the way that your smart contract is structured and the possible technical uses or state changes or uh, uh, implementation details of your platform that would, that would prove that this is a utility token, may not matter if your marketing team makes claims that put a huge target on your company from the SEC's perspective. So uh, that, that, that stuff is, is really important. And, and, and this is an equally important lesson for people in, in the audience who are marketing and communications professionals. Um, now, not only would your mandate, if you were working with one of these companies, be to uh, tell that company's story, but it's also really important that you don't put the company in legal hot water, um, which is different than, than a lot of other uh, situations that you might find yourself in. Uh, just, just a warning, in five minutes we have a hard stop to leave the room. So okay. We have five solid minutes. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I've only got two more examples left. Okay, so crypto <laughs> Uh My personal opinion is that crypto kitties are probably not securities. Um, the, uh, the reason why uh, has to do in part because of crypto kitties marketing, which uh, didn't, uh, in my opinion, hasn't uh, offered an expectation for profit. Uh, although, please feel free to disagree with me on that point. Um, you don't need to rely on CryptoKitties uh, company to, um, to take care of your investment. Uh, you are the owner of your CryptoKitty and your actions, uh, at least in part, determine the future value of, of your CryptoKitty. So, um, and, and you're signing the transactions to, to do anything uh, with that smart contract. And uh, sales are peer to peer. You don't have to buy or sell your CryptoKitty through CryptoKitties, um, which, which is true for some other ICOs, but anyways. I, I, think, I think that, um, at least in my opinion, the, these, are, these are probably not a security. Oh, and Peter Van Valkenburg also wrote a fantastic article specifically on CryptoKitties and the Howey test. So. There, that's another great, great resource to look at uh, if you want more detail on this. And then the last one is from yesterday, Kodak Coin. <laughs> so um, Kodak, Kodak has decided to create a, a, a blockchain-based token. They didn't say which platform it would be on. As a 506C private placement. Now this is because they're a legitimate company. They're a household name. They can't, unlike Munchie, they can't just offer a security for sale and completely ignore regulation. So they have to, what they've done is they've, is they've, is they've uh, 
uh, structured this in a way that uh, it, it, fought, it, it, it follows SEC laws for securities for a private placement. Um, but that means that everybody who purchases a Kodak coin must be an accredited investor, which means you have like you know 200 grand income or a million or more uh, in assets, um, which is fine until you go to do stuff on the platform. So if you pay, the idea is that you use the Kodak coin to pay photographers for licensing agreements. So if you do that, then. Um, then now the photographer has just gotten paid in Kodak coin, but when the photographer gets paid, it's still a, it's still a 506C private placement security. So if you, as the photographer, who probably is not an accredited investor, want to go and sell your, uh, your Kodak coin for cash, you can only do that to an accredited investor, which sounds really complicated and annoying from the photographer's perspective, if the other alternative was you getting paid in cash. <laughs> so this is a great learning opportunity. It's an example of, uh, of securities law ruining platform economics. So Kodak coin isn't necessarily illegal, but the platform economics and the viability of using this platform is compromised to the point of making it, in my opinion, pretty useless if, uh, if Securities laws place really tough restrictions on what on what uh, users of the system can do uh, with with assets. Uh, but the crazy thing is the stock price. <laughs> Here it was at three dollars until the announcement, and then it went all the way up to seven dollars. Kodak. So if you think that um, that this platform isn't viable, then maybe a trading opportunity would be to uh, ride that price back down to three. Or maybe it would work and the, and the stock price will go up. This is very strange. Uh, and, and oh yeah, so this is the final thing, additional resources. Uh, there's Go to the SEC, go to Coinbase, and go to this, uh, this law firm, WSGR, that has a great document about, uh, about the Howie test. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, yeah, so we're going to slum it now. Uh, there's a food court on the second floor with a lot, lot of seating, and some of the restaurants there are still open until 7. So we'll just hang out there. Uh, but there isn't like a good bar other than uh, Marshall's Landing. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to be down there if you guys want to chat more. But we have to vacate this room like in the next uh, two minutes.